All right, so some of this stuff you've seen before, we're going to do this lesson in three parts. So we'll get the least familiar part. Well, except this is fairly familiar. But we're going to do this first. Now, some of the special points on functions, the ones that you always want to know first, are in particular the x-intercepts. The y-intercepts sometimes, but the x-intercepts for sure. Remember, x-intercepts can also be called the zeros of a function, the solutions of a function, or the roots of a function. Yes? Are you taking good notes? All right. So what do you know from last chapter you always do, whether you're familiar with the equation or not, to find x-intercepts. And if y'all want to demask and say it out loud, that will work. So yeah, what did we say? Because you're, you're doing a good job reading. What did we say last time? And that's all right. It's all right to use your resources, right? It'd be crazy not to use your resources. What did we say last chapter? Anytime you want to find the next intercept, you do what? Yeah, put 0 in for y, solve for x. So in this case, if I want to put 0 in for y, what's in place of y? That's why it says that we're putting f of x equal to 0 and solving for x. So absolutely, it does not hurt. In fact, I think it's optimal to use your resources. So if you can read it, yeah, use it. Okay, so now what kind of equation are we left solving? So what should you do? try first when you're trying to solve the quadratic? AC method. We're going to try to factor it. Now, guys, this is going to be an easy one to factor because 2x squared must be 2x times x. So we're minimizing our options. We can factor it faster. So what is A times C? negative 18 so what could i do to go from negative 18 somehow to use factors and get negative 17. negative 18 and positive 1. so wouldn't it have to be negative 18 right here and plus 1 in the center okay so what we want to do is get to the point you don't have to write all those multiple steps that we are speeding up writing less stuff on the factoring. So, of course, that gives us x equals negative 1 half and x equals 9. And we always report intercepts at this point as points. So I'm going to say these are my answers for the zeros or the roots or the solutions or the x-intercepts, whatever you want to call them, yes? Awesome. So now on the next one, I know now it's the process. Oh, I'm supposed to set everything equal. Instead of the g of x, I'm going to set it equal to 0. So this is one of those things that by the end of the term, you're going to go, wow, like why did I make that so hard at first? It's going to be one of those things you just get better at. Guys, what must be true if an entire fraction reduces to 0? Yes, okay, so if you have any number, um, 0 over any number, does that equal 0? All right, what about the bottom? Can the bottom be 0? No, any number over 0 is going to be undefined, so the bottom can't be 0. But you say, oh, well, if the top has got to be 0 for the whole fraction to be 0, suddenly that's a much easier equation to solve, and that's the point is recognize this looks messy, but it boils down to something simple. So then, then what's x? You got it. So you all know this. You may have to slow down and think about it, but you definitely know it. You've got the algebra skill set already. So we're just putting together things. You know a lot of what we're doing actually today. Um, so the same thing, if I want to find the zeros of h of x, I actually just say, well, let me set the equation equal to zero. So I'm going to ask you this. Can we do this in one step? Can you isolate the square root for me? Two-fifths. I'm hearing you very, very quietly. So what do you do to both sides now? So x minus 4 equals
Four twenty-fifths. Now, I think that four, isn't that one hundred twenty-fifths? What's X? One hundred and four twenty-fifths. Now, notice that not a one of these said anything about solving on the calculator. That means they're not calculator problems. So that was the biggest issue I saw in the quiz, is on the ones that I said, find the intercepts. Some people thought, it's a calculator problem, but it didn't say that. So you would have lost um, partial credit there. So make sure that you don't start using your calculator unless you've been told it's a calculator problem at this point. So speaking of calculator problems, on this one it specifically says we'll use the calculator. I'm going to ask you because if we can save time in certain places I want to. Do you all feel like that you know how to put this on the graphing calculator and go through the calculate um, zero? Is there anybody that's like, mm, you're okay? Let me skip this then. Hey, what kind of function is k of x? Quartic. So what letter of the alphabet would it look like if you graphed it? What was what did you say, Lucas? Oh. Yeah. W or an M. So which one is it in this case? W, yeah. So what you're going to do, guys, is, of course, you're going to have some kind of W shape. I don't know exactly what it is. But the x-axis is either going to run below the W altogether, which means no real roots. It might run through, like, if it ran through, like, right there, you would have two real roots. And if it runs through, like, right there, you would have four real roots. Are you with me? But you all feel like you do know how to do that on the calculator? Then I'm going to bypass it. All right, if that's something you feel confident with on the calculator, let's move on. Oh, by the way, since you get to use the calculator, how many decimal places? Three to four decimal places on your answers. All right, so I'm going to bypass this, and we'll say this is the skill you've got in place already. So let's spend our time on the stuff that's newer. Take a minute and sketch this. Because you're going to want to have it for your notes. All right, so we are going to be looking at special points on functions. We've already said one of the kinds of special points are the x-intercepts or the zeros or the roots. Now, the other kinds of special points are the extrema. So if I ask you what, if I said name your siblings, what would I mean for you to tell me? What's that word siblings mean? I mean brothers and sisters, right? That way I can use one word and don't have to say name your brothers and sisters. I can just say lump them together and call them your siblings. So the extrema is a way to lump together the maxima and the minima. And you might go, well, that's weird. Guys, extrema, maxima, and minima, that's plural. All right, the singular is extremum, maximum, now it sounds more normal, and minimum, okay? So we normally just call them the mins and maxes, right? But that's actually short. So um, sometimes people will call them the extreme values, but now I'm using words that you're going to use all the time in calculus. So I cannot ask you to talk about intervals where a function is increasing, decreasing, and constant without first talking about the mins and maxes or the extrema, okay? So a maxima is not a car. It's the plural of maximum. So have you thought about it? Now you'll have to start thinking about it. How many vehicles are actually named after math terms, okay? So... Um, on this one, guys, when you're looking at a local min, now you might say, why are you calling it local? It's local as opposed to absolute. An absolute min would be the absolute lowest point on the graph, period. Can you see why this graph would not have an absolute min? There's a reason. Yeah, Allie? Yeah, the right-hand end continues to run downward and to the right, 
which means it will never have an absolute lowest point, but it will have a local min. And a local min is just the lowest point in a little area of the graph. So here's what you're looking for on local mins, all right? A local min, since uh, not everybody can see me motioning, is just where a graph decreases and then turns and increases, all right? And a local max is just a point where the graph increases and then turns and decreases. So it doesn't have to be the absolute highest point in the graph. It's just a highest point. It's just like the little hill, a little hilltop. Okay, it doesn't have to be the biggest mountain in the in the in the whole mountain range. Just a little hilltop. And these are all points when you name them. So do you all see? I'm seeing two mins and one max. Do you all see what I see? Okay. So this is a min. That is not where I touched the board. Now you all know when you watch the videos and you think I'm crazy. Really. The gra it just does not hit where I want it to hit all the time. That's a min. And then I see another min right here. And then I see my max right there. So some people will say, well, why not this point right here? Why isn't it something? Because right there, the graph increases and then goes um, flat. So for it to be a max, it's got to increase then decrease. Okay? So anywho, what would you say that each of these mins, like what are the coordinates of this first min? Yeah. Negative 4, negative 2. Yeah. What's the next one? And I'm going to say comma. What's this min? Three negative three. I'm going to pretend like I heard you saying that. Between your mass and my headset, I'm not hearing much of anything. So what about your max? What's it? Four negative one. Now, you may be saying in a second, but wait, how can you tell that that's a point, but that's an interval because they look the same? You know when you're in English class, y'all know that there are words that have double meanings, right? And so when you see the word to try to figure out which meaning, don't you have to like read the whole sentence or the paragraph it's in in order to deduce the meaning of the word in that particular context? We're going to do the same thing here, all right? So when you do intervals over which a function is increasing and decreasing and constant, you're going to have to write an interval with parentheses, left x, comma, right x. That's always the format. Okay? So, what's it mean for a graph to be increasing? Super easy. It just means as you read it left to right, the graph is rising. So, I see that it's increasing here and here. So, I see two intervals over which the graph is increasing. Are you following me on that? All right, so I'm going to say that here I've got to go from my left x, and y'all just told me the coordinates of that min are at negative 4, to my right x, and I'm going to estimate that to be negative 2.5 or negative 5 halves. We all right? I don't like putting un, unverified fractions on there. But wait a minute, what do I put between intervals when I want to say, oh, it's in this interval or it's in that interval? Union. So that's a big giveaway. Negative 4, negative 5 halves could be a point, but when you see the union symbol, union only occurs with intervals. So now I instantly know, oh, this is intervals that I'm talking about. So how would you name the second green interval over which the graph increases? 3 to 4. The left x is 3. The right x is 4. Now, here's the typical thing that people do wrong. They either want to tell me from this point to that point, and they actually write full points out, or because they're looking low to high, they want to give me from a low y to a high y. But you're going to read this. You read when you're talking about intervals that a graph is doing something, talk about the x's just like you do with domain. Okay? All right, so decreasing. Obviously, 
If increasing means the graph is rising as you read left to right, decreasing means the graph is falling as you read left to right. So all of these are intervals. Woo, there's three of them over which the graph decreases. All right, big question. How do you write the leftmost interval? How would you do left x to right x on that? Negative infinity to negative 4. Union. What about the middle red piece? 2. Got it. Union. What about the third red piece? Perfect. So, guys, it's not difficult and it's not time consuming, but you do want good notes because otherwise you'll go back and you'll just do all kinds of crazy stuff. And we're trying to avoid crazy. We're trying to get things nailed down where we start really rocking and rolling. And your grades are going to come along. I mean, I know they will. You're just still in the middle of the growing pains. So, junior year is hard, pre calculus is hard. It's just a more mature class, but you'll get there. You will. You're figuring it out right now. You're figuring out what to try and then what not to try, right? What gets you caught? So, guys, um, constant means horizontal, okay? It's a flat part of the graph. The graph isn't rising or falling from on the blue piece, right? So, a constant function means a function that's a horizontal line, all right? That's all constant means. So, where would you say it's constant? Thank you for speaking up to where I can hear you through all of our problems that we've got communicating these days. So, guys, are you okay on this? Most graphs, by the way, unless I create some weird graph, like I just like created a graph for us to talk about here, there are graphs that have constant sections, but most naturally occurring functions do not. All right, I would have to create like a weird piecewise function or something like I've done here. So, um, do you feel all right on this part? All right, so here's the deal. I can ask you to do all of these questions if I give you a graph that I like make up like I did on this one. I could also ask you to talk about these things if I give you an equation. All right, let's look at P of X. Let's look at what we already know. Do you recognize that P of X is a cubic function? All right. Do you recognize, oh, just let me on a second. Thank you. All right, do you recognize that it's a leading coefficient's positive, so its right end is up? All right. Do you also see that 1 is a double root, while negative 2 is a single root? Y'all with me? All right, so we're pulling together all this stuff that y'all learned in Algebra 2. So I've got a quick graph, like super fast. Now, does that cubic function have any extrema? How many maxes, how many mins? One and one, right? So which one can you see from the graph right now? You know exactly where it is. The minimum is? Yeah. One zero. So that's definite. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say that's the min. So I've got some max sitting up here. But I, I mean, like I could guess where it is. I don't need parentheses. I could guess where it is, but I'm not really for sure where it is. So, um, and, and remember, I just freehanded. So there's nothing that says that my graph is accurate. It's reasonable, but it's not perfectly accurate. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go find it on the calculator. So we've got to make sure you've got that skill in place. So plug this into Y1. Do you need to multiply it out first? No. Your calculator accepts factored form. Use it. It goes faster. So I'm going to say Y equals, and let me turn on. I'm going to turn on my Y2 and then turn off my Y4. That's from third block. So I entered it just like what was written. You good? I'm going to zoom six. 
That's the graph I did. Just that one's red and mine was yellow. We okay? So what we don't know is the max, and the max is over here. So I'm going to trace, and I'm going to... Now, what I'm doing is I'm watching the cursor rise, but I'm really watching the Ys. So right now I'm at 3.8. So 3.97 is higher. 3.98 is higher. So right now it's my money's on that. And then I drop back to 3.85. Are you with me? So if you go and you sit on the highest point, you've got to straddle the high point. So guys, always get to your high point or your lowest point, back off to the left because you always start on the left side. And I've got to sandwich what I think is the high point between my left bound and right bound. So I'm going to go to, try not to somehow turn that off, second, calculate the best menu on the calculator. I'm trying to find the max, right? So choose choice four. Y'all know, y'all have y'all done this before? Good. All right, so left bound, yes. Now, if I go to the right once, I'm back on the 3.98, which was the highest point. I have to go one more time to the right, so I make sure I've straddled it, and my Y values have started to come back down again. So enter, and then enter with the guess. So... That to, to three decimal places or four decimal places, that's going to round to negative one comma four. Are we okay? All right. So I'm going to come back over here, and I'm going to say my max is at negative one comma four. Now we can do increasing, decreasing, and constant. So now I can go, okay, so here's the increasing part. And what would you say my answer is on increases on? Yes, you needed the x coordinate of the max. Yes, union. Now, how do I go from here to here? You need the x coordinate of the min. Yes, yeah, so see, I can't ask you to do increasing and decreasing until I know you know the x-coordinates of the maxes and mins. Are we all right? So then the decreasing on, of course, is this part. This is not going to look good with the pink background or purple, whatever that is. So what are you going to say it's decreasing on? From max to min? Yep, negative 1 to 1. I'm going to skip Q of X for right now. I'll come back to it. But you all said you have had experience. Um, look, I'll tell you what. Let's look at this just real quick because I want to show you something. Um, Q of X is in a factored form. And a lot of people are like, I don't, I don't know what that looks like. But I'm trying to show you guys that on this, if X is zero... Q of X all goes to zero. So zero is a root. And look, if X is four, it would be four times the square root of zero, which is zero. So four is a root. So I, I know some information just from like algebraically figuring it out. Are you with me? Let's graph this because you may not know what it looks like, nor should you. You've never had to. So I've got a little information, but this is me being smarter than my calculator again. I'm going to turn off Y2. I'm going to turn on Y3. And you're going to see that your calculator is limited. It gets a little weird on certain points of a graph. Did we not already figure out that 4, 0 is an x-intercept? Okay. Is the calculator showing you that? No. Okay. So you've just got to realize the calculator is a bit limited. So now I can go back and say, well, it looks a little weird, but this is what the graph looks like. It goes forever and ever left, but it stops at 4, 0. Why? Can I plug in x equals 5? Can I go to the right of 4? No, because then I start getting the square root of negative numbers. Are we all right? Okay. Does that graph have any maxes or mins? It has a max. It does not have a local min. 
because there's never a place where it, it goes down, then turns and goes back up. So it doesn't have any local mins. It doesn't have an absolute min either. It does have a local max right here, wherever that is. And you remember, my sketch is a fairly poor sketch. And that local max is actually also the absolute max. It's the absolute highest point in the graph. So do y'all want to see if you can go find it? Do you feel confident enough to do that? I'm getting about 2.666, yes, take off. So do you all have this written down so you can tell me when I go, when I go further? Four decimal places, I would say this is what, 2.6667. What did you get for the other, it was like three point something or other maybe? Did I write down what you said correctly? Yeah. All right. Now, where's it increasing? Negative infinity to 2.6667. You got it. And where's it decreasing? You got it. Okay. Are we all right? So again, you can't do increasing, decreasing without also thinking in terms of maxes and mins. Those two concepts go right together. And that's a lot of the first part of the lesson. So now, guys, we're going to talk about something different. Our last big idea on special points, we've had zeros. Now we've had extrema, which lumps together maxes and mins. And now we're going to look at points of inflection. All right, so listen. Calculus is a lot about extrema and points of inflection. You're going to learn to do those by hand in calculus. So we can do this year, we can do maxes and mins on the calculator. You cannot do points of inflection on the calculator. So the only way I can ask you to do points of inflection this year is if I say here's a graph and then I can ask you questions about it. So there's no way for you algebraically to do that this year. That's why you've got calculus still sitting out there. And the calculator will never be able to find it for you. So it says, um, look for changes in concavity. Well, we got to talk about what does concavity mean? Well, I will be happy to show you. So concave up. means the graph is shaped so that it could like hold water kind of so like definitely a pair a parabolic shape could be concave up all right if you look at exponential growth that's concave up and actually exponential decay is concave up all right all of those are uh functions that are concave up so concave down would be the exact opposite. A parabola that opens downward is concave down. One of the first probably graphs, hopefully, that you would think about that's concave down is a square root function. That's concave down. Or you could think of um, like a logarithm is concave down. It looks a lot like a square root function. Or a square root function that's been turned this way is still concave down. Are you all right? So you are looking for, for points of inflection, you want points on the graph where you see a change from concave up to concave down or vice versa. 
So on this graph, there is one point of inflection. What do you think? Two zeros. Two zeros, correct. Okay. So that's not the only point where the graph seems to change shape, but that's the only point that fits our description. So right here, this guy is a point of inflection. All right. Because do you see that this descending part of the graph went from concave down and then the concave up. Does that make sense? But like some people are like, well, why not this first min right here? Because even though the graph changes from decreasing to increasing, this whole first piece of the graph looks like a parabola that opens up. So it's concave up the entire way. It changes from concave up to linear. It's got to be concave up to concave down or vice versa. This goes concave down to concave up. This goes concave up to linear, all right, and then linear to linear. So we're looking specifically for concave up to concave down or vice versa. Are you all with me? So when you start talking about concavity, you're going to get to be sounding like bigger geeks. I'm going to be very proud of you. Um, just by the way, there are graphs that you all know that are real common. Like think about... Um, if I said, well, look about y equals x cubed, don't we know that that graph is centered on the origin, and it looks like that, right? That's a real typical graph that has a point of inflection at 0, 0, and it goes from concave down to concave up. Are you all with me on that? Well, what about y equals x cubed? Cube root of x, I mean, I've already done x cubed. So that graph looks like this. Hopefully you know these parent functions. And that graph goes from concave up to concave down. So there's lots of graphs that you all know that actually would have a point of inflection. Are we all right? Is everybody okay? Yes? Why would that be concave up to concave down? Why is this concave up? Like, a lot of times I'll say, act like you could extend it in that pattern. Do you see if you extended it, it would form a, like a complete bowl this way? But wouldn't it keep going down? Yeah, but it's always going to be like this. Okay. It's never going to go... You see what I'm saying? It's not going to have a little tail that trails off and goes straight down. So... Um, and you'll you'll get better at recognizing those shapes. It's brand new right now, but... That's the idea. We okay? All right, so I'm really going to get you to sound geeky now. We're going to talk about, okay, here's the adjective. I mean, here's the noun, monotonicity. All right? So if you're concerned about finding a prom date, ladies and gentlemen, if you spend time talking about concavity and monotonicity at lunch, you are sure to secure a prom date because brains are beautiful. People will start listening and go, I want to go to prom with that person. Um, what's the prefix mono mean? I promise. If you don't believe me, just try it. Okay. So what's mono mean? Monotonic functions go in one direction. They are either monotonic increasing or monotonic decreasing. So if they're monotonic increasing... They could be monotonic increasing and linear in shape. They could be monotonic increasing and concave up in shape. They could be monotonic increasing and concave down in shape. They could be monotonic increasing and have a change in concavity. Are you with me? So, I mean, we could, we could do this and do this and do this and do this. But it just means they increase over their entire domains. Okay? For as, as, as long as the graph exists, it's increasing. So then monotonic decreasing 
means the exact opposite. It means they decrease over the entire graph. So they could be decreasing and linear. They could be decreasing and concave up. They could be decreasing and concave down. Or they could be decreasing with a shape change. Hey, always, sometimes, or never. These guys are hard. Do you remember doing these in, in, in geometry? Like always, sometimes, or never. A square is blah, 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 a rectangle. Always, sometimes, or never. Always. But I could say a quadrilateral is blah, 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 a parallelogram. Sometimes, because you could draw a, a quadrilateral that is a parallelogram, and you could draw a quadrilateral that's like a trapezoid, which is not a parallelogram, right? So always, sometimes, or never. Monotonic functions, always, sometimes, or never, have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. Never. Okay. Show me, show me a graph, just hold up your arms. Show me a graph that is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Yeah, perfect. Emma Higgins has given me an absolute value graph. Is it monotonic? No. So if, if I've got this into the graph to make it symmetric with respect to the y-axis, the mirror image has to be like this, right? That's the only way. So I can ask you more questions like that where you're using your vocabulary so, um, monotonic functions always, sometimes, or never have local extrema. Never. Because doesn't a local extrema happen like if the graph goes up, then down? Well, that right there means it's not monotonic. Are you with me? Okay. Always, sometimes, or never. A monotonic function has a point of inflection. Sometimes, yeah. Here are two that have points of inflection, but here are three that don't. So they sometimes do, they sometimes don't. So you are, you are going to approach geekdom with that. All right, now, even in odd functions, guys, we've already laid the groundwork for this. So this is going to go fast. I will post the flip chart, too, so y'all can see it if you don't get a good sketch. When you're sketching, it doesn't have to be perfect. Like, you can say, okay, the first graph looks like uh, this, this, and that. So I'm getting a basic shape, but I'm not killing myself, okay? So I've got a good image, but it didn't take me but, like, what, 20 seconds to sketch it? So do you remember when we were talking about symmetry, we said that if you have a graph symmetric with respect to the y-axis, and it is a function, then we call it an even function. Do you all remember that? All right, so we're going to talk about, we need to make sure now, you're going to do the exact same thing. Remember how I asked you to build the t-charts, and then your answer was symmetric with respect to the origin, or symmetric with respect to the y-axis. You're going to build the exact same t-charts, but now your answer is going to be even function, odd function, whatever it is. You're going to do the exact same thing. So even functions are symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Now, if a graph is symmetric with respect to the y-axis, as far as you go right, you have to go that far left, and you go up together, or you go down together. So opposite x's, same y's. That's the way you build symmetry with respect to the y-axis. Are you with me? So this is saying opposite x's, but you got the same y's. Okay? That's numerically what's going on. Now, when I was in high school, I always saw this definition. f of x is an even function if f of negative x equals f of x. And I would write it down and nod my head. And I did not know what it meant. It just seemed like gibberish to me. Guys, it just means what this is saying. All right, it's saying when you plug in opposite x's, so if you plug in an x and a negative x, the y value you get, the y value that you get is the same y value. 
And that's what this is saying. Opposite x's produce the same y values. Are we okay? So odd functions. This is the O, O, O rule. Odd functions are symmetric with respect to the origin. And opposite x's give me opposite y's. O, O, and O. Odd, opposite, and origin. Are we okay? So remember, odd functions, you have to go as far as you go left, you go that far right. But if one hand goes up, the other hand goes down. So that's opposite y's. So opposite x's, opposite y's. Are we okay? So again, I always saw f of x is an odd function if f of negative x equals negative f of x. And I would shake my head and I would write it down and I would act like I knew what it meant. I didn't know what it meant. It just says when you plug in opposite x's, the y values you get, so the y value you get here is f of negative x, and the y value you get here is f of x. They are opposite in sign. So this is the opposite of f of x. It's the negative of f of x. So it's just reinforcing what you're seeing here. Okay? Now, don't be alarmed. The majority of our functions are neither even nor odd. So it's not like, like, what kind of function is this? It's quadratic function. So the quadratic function does have some uh, symmetry with respect to the vertical line. Looks like x equals 3. But it's not even or odd because the symmetry is not with respect to the y-axis or the origin. Are you with me? What kind of function is this? Exponential growth function. You got it. And this is going to play right into what you're going to start doing tomorrow. Exponential functions are typical functions. They don't have symmetry at all. All right? So what kind of function is this? Square root function. Square root functions are something that you've seen lots of. They don't have symmetry or either. So most functions are neither even nor odd. Are we okay? All right. So let's look at then some even and odd problems. This is not bad. I really like these, in fact. All right, so if f of x is an even function, so key piece of information, when you're writing down the given information, like on your homework, you could write down even is one thing they're giving. You could write down f of 4 equals negative 3. That's another thing they're giving. Giving and now it's asking you give two points that must be on the graph of f of x. Opposite to what? But what what point are you trying to make it opposite? Don't overthink it. What are they specifically telling you? Hey, this point's on the graph. Yeah, so one of the two points is 4, negative 3. Now, Luke, so what point do you consider its opposite? Even... So what other point would be on the graph? If I go 4, negative 3, I have to go negative 4, negative 3. Yeah. Are we okay? Now, the next one, if you're jotting down the given information on the homework, g of x is odd. g of negative 6 is 7. There, you've got the given information down. So you don't have to write out whole sentences. So now you're going to go really, really fast, right? So what is one point that's for sure on the graph? There you go. That's easy. So odd. So negative 6, 7, and negative 7. Yeah. So 6, negative 7. Opposite, opposite. Those are easy, right? 
They don't take long, but they get at the uh, they get at the idea. Now look at these next three. How did we test symmetry with respect to the x-axis, y-axis origin in chapter one? We built t-charts, so we're going to do the exact same thing. And that way, this is something familiar. So I'm not going to pick x equals one because it would give me a zero. I need answers that give me definite signs. So maybe I'll pick x equals like two and negative two. And then I'll keep going if I need to. So what would you get when you plug in 2? 2 times the square root of 3. What do you get when you plug in negative 2? Negative 2 square root 3. So now wait a minute. You've got related y's. What's your gut feeling right now? Yeah, you've got 2, 2 square root 3, negative 2, negative 2 square root 3. That's feeling odd. So now pick something else. 3, 4, what do you want to pick? 4, four. okay. So that's 4 square root of, and it's negative 4 square root of. Yeah, so now I'm going to say it was more than a coincidence. If it comes up twice, I'm going to call it a trend. So now I can go, yep, it's odd function. So what do I expect you to write? The equation, the t-chart, the answer, and move on. Don't belabor it, guys. There's something specific to write, but it doesn't have to take you forever. So now on g of x, we're going to do the same deal, pickles. So what do you want to pick? Four again? And then negative 4. So if I pick 4, that's going to give me 16 minus 12 plus 5. What's that giving me? <laughs> when I pl plug in negative 4, I've got 16 plus 12 plus O. Oh, what's that give me? 33. I think you're right. Those are completely unrelated Y's. So what's that tell you? It's neither even nor odd. There's no need for me to do more. If you get one bad set of X's, like unrelated Y's, it, it's neither. Move on. So what would you assume about this last one? If there's three options and we're doing three problems, do you think it's going to be even? See? All right. What, in geometry, what did you take sine, cosine, and tangent of? Well, you did sine, cosine, and tangent of the acute angles in a right triangle, right? So, like, pick something. Pick an angle that might be an acute angle in a right triangle. All right, 32 degrees. Guys, is your calculator on degree mode? Because something tells me you don't have the whole entire trig table memorized, so we might need to punch this in our calculator, right? I certainly don't have the whole entire trig table memorized. All right, go to mode. <sighs> so if it's on radian mode, come down here and put it on degree mode. Enter. Second, quit so you can go back to your home screen. Your home screen is where you make your calculations. So what is the cosine of 32 degrees? 848. Three to four decimal places. You gave me three. What's the cosine of negative 32 degrees? Well, shazam. If you punch in cosine of 60 and cosine of negative 60, I can beat you on this. Yep, do you have a half? Yeah. And then are you getting a half again? So the cosine function is an even function. Yay. So guys, you're doing the exact same thing that you did last chapter. But last chapter you would have said symmetry with respect to the y-axis. Now you just say even and move on. Are you okay? So we kind of prepped for this already. So one last thing that I could ask you to do on that one. What if I had said, um, okay, here's a graph like that. 
And I said, can you draw the rest of the graph so that you produce an even function? Could you sketch that? Yeah, I mean, hopefully you could. You would go, well, let's see. I've got to go like that. Something like that. Can you draw? Can you do the drawings? That's the only other even odd questions I could ask. So always, sometimes, or never. Odd functions are always, sometimes, or never. Monotonic. Sometimes. So I'll, I'll write it down here. Um, so if you're going to say sometimes, you need to be able to show, well, I can get an odd function that is also monotonic, but I can get an odd function that's not monotonic. If you can draw one of each, then it's a sometimes, right? So odd and monotonic might be your, it's not where I drew it, it might be your good old y equals x cubed kind of graph. Odd and not monotonic. So how about this? Still a cubic function, but that's not monotonic now. Are you with me? Or I could do a variety of other things. All right, last thing, guys. Average value. Let me take you through this to where you at least get one example. Average rate of change, I said average value. Average rate of change is huge, but here's the good news. It means slope. All right? Rates of changes are slope. And you might go, you're nuts, because I see that f of x is not linear. So how can you find a slope? I'll show you what you're looking at. But here's what you need to know. Algebraically, this is all you do. To find the average rate of change, you just do f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. Oh, that's a slope. That's a difference quotient. Change in y's over change in x's. So you're saying, well, what b, what a? Do you all recognize that that's an interval? So it's specifying left x, right x. So I would simply say f of 2 minus f of negative 1 all over 2 minus negative 1. It's very quick. I'll show you what it's for, and then when you're in calculus, you'll really find out while we do it. But what would you say in this problem that f of 2 is? Perfect. What is f of negative 1? Yeah, so I didn't wind up needing the parentheses there. 2 minus a negative 1 is 3, so what's the answer? One. Now, you might be going, um, like, why would you do that? That seems silly. All right. Do you all agree that y equals x squared plus 3 is a parabola up 3? Everybody good? And then from there, the a value is 1, so I'm going to go out 1, up 1. Guys, I connected negative 1, 4 to 2, 7. The line goes through the curve, so it's called a secant. Average rate of change is just the slope of the secant.
Bye, guys. I will post the flip chart so you can look at it at home, too.